Just a little bit of Jewish history. From about 1020 to 920 BC, Israel was the greatest nation on earth. Largely because of the blessings of God through three of their great kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. And then it all fell apart. And there was hardly anything left. And into that milieu comes one of the greatest voices the Old Testament will ever hear, the voice of the prophet Isaiah. The text that is before us this morning is Isaiah dreaming of a new hope. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Holy Spirit shall rest upon him. Here comes the words of confirmation. Do you remember? The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. And then li and then it Listen to these words and have it paint for you the picture that I think it wants to paint. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The lesson ends here. Please be seated. Join me in a word of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The only way I can describe it is that it was an absolute train wreck. King Solomon died in 922 B.C. And most of the rest of the kings that followed him broke every law in the book. Ahaz. Ahab, Manasseh, Jehoiakim, they broke the covenant, they worshipped false gods, they disregarded the poor, they cheated their own people. Folks, this went on almost, count them, for 300 years. If only they had a decent king. And then, into the middle of all of this maelstrom, comes the voice of the prophet Isaiah. And in this text, he speaks of a new king from the line of David. Listen again to some of these words. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. With righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child will lead them. Luke talks about him as the savior of God, the king of the world. The Alleluia Chorus talks about him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He comes, folks, to bring about the kind of justice and righteousness and, and, and compassion that Ahab and Ahaz and Jehoiakim did not. But he came to bring one other thing. Remember the time he was walking into Jerusalem when he was an older gentleman about to die 
And he looks down over the city. And what does he do? He weeps. Do you remember what he says? If only today you knew the things that make for peace. Peace is what he comes to bring. Peace among nations, peace within families, peace inside our own skins. But let's be careful with that word, peace. Fred Beekner once said that the kind of peace Jesus brings is not the absence of war. It's the presence of love. Maybe that's why he wept over Jerusalem and weeps still over Washington and Baghdad and Beijing. Maybe he didn't find the kind of love needed to bring about that kind of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, 2,000 years later, we still celebrate his coming. And maybe we do that because deep down inside of every last one of us, we realize that it is the, ju it is the justice and righteousness and compassion and peace that he brings that we most need. He's here. Isaiah's hope came true. And one day he will come again in all his glory and his peace will seep into every nook and cranny of our world. The question is, in the meantime, what do we do? How do we act? How do we spend our days? I think you know that. I think we all know. I want to tell you a story that all of us have heard, I suspect, it's somewhere in our own lives. I don't know whether it's a true story or not. Maybe some of you can tell me whether it's true or not. Of those two people walking down the seashore, is this a true story? And along the seashore, they come across all of those stranded starfish. And the one person gets down on the knees and picks up a starfish and throws it into the surf. And the other person says, that's absolutely ridiculous. You can't make a difference. There's too many starfish. And the person gets down on his knees, picks up another starfish, throws it into the surf and says, I made a difference for that one. I made a difference for that one. My dear Christian friends, in between the first coming and the second coming, in the middle of broken covenants and false gods, in the midst of a darkness so deep that you can't cut it with a knife, our calling is to make a difference. Every one of us can make a difference. In your house, at your church, in your place of employment, at your school, in your neighborhood, every one of us can make a difference. Every one of us can love the poor and reach out to the hurting and show love to the unlovable even when they most need it. By how we act and how we live and how we forgive. Every one of us can make a difference in that world. Because one day, the Arab will live with the Jew, and the Republican will sit down with the Democrat, and the American, and the Russian, and the Korean, and the Syrian, We'll live together in peace the way God intended. Until that day comes, you and I can hold each other's hand as we did earlier and work with the Holy Spirit to bring about that kind of peace. One life, one relationship, one starfish, at a time.